not kidding. This was uh, only put together about two weeks ago, I guess. Right. So Kelly is from Connecticut. Welcome. Kim Parfait is in Idaho. Hey, Kim. I know a Kim Parfait in Idaho. What do you teach? I guess is Kim in Idaho or Wyoming? Or Colorado. She gets around. Kim's a little quantum. You know, she can be in two places at one time. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Idaho, Cheyenne. Is it cold out there? Um, in in Idaho, it's raining. It's been raining for days, but it's it's snowing in high elevations, which is great. And in Wyoming, it's very windy. Yeah, it's supposed to be windy here. You know, for those of us who follow TWIV, have you heard of TWIV this week in virology? Those guys always start every podcast with. <laughs> Each one of them reports the weather in their part of the country. Yeah, it's great. It is annoying and very endearing at the same time. <laughs> Looks like Kelly teaches freshman biology. Great. Larry is joining us from Long Island, teaching at non-public special needs high school, chemistry, environmental science, and biology. Great, welcome. Okay. Well, I hope you find our models useful. All right, as you can see on our screen, uh, we have two more sessions today. So we'll have Sensational Water with Alice Sheely and Uncovering Student Thinking with Models, Membrane and Transport with Kim Parfit in Idaho. So please join us for both of those. About two more minutes. Oh, thank you, Kelly. I hope you join us for our water session. Thank you. Wow, that's a nice combination. Chemistry, physics, and AP bio. Wow. Those sound like multiple preps. <laughs> Busy person. Yeah. And we'll get started in one minute. We do want you to know that if you have questions, you can enter them in the chat or if you want to make a comment. Um, but you can also just unmute yourself and um, ask away. And um, you're welcome to have your video on or off, whatever you are most comfortable with. Yeah, it looks like it's gonna be a small workshop. So I'm not at all opposed to people unmuting themselves and just uh, shouting out during the, the session. Chris will mute you if, uh, <laughs> if your dog starts barking or something. That is true. <laughs> Sometimes I've been known to mute Tim also, <laughs> but I won't do that today. <laughs> Um, so we, it's 10 hour. <laughs> so it's 10 30 so we'll go ahead and get started again welcome to CRISPR connecting new science to what you teach uh, recordings from all the slides um, and the session recordings and slides from all the sessions will be available on our website and please join us for our last two sessions um, that we're holding today now I'd like to introduce to you Tim Herman. Uh, Dr. Herman is the director of the Center for Biomolecular Modeling at MSOE. He has 25 years of experience producing physical models of proteins and other molecular structures for science researchers and classroom educators. Tim received his BS in chemistry from the University of Nebraska and his PhD in biochemistry from Oregon State University. He pursued postdoctoral studies in molecular biology at Harvard Medical School. Welcome, Tim. Thank you. Chris, it's not Oregon, it's Oregon. So I'm from Wisconsin, it's Oregon. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, yeah, welcome to the coronavirus session. Science is the answer. And um, yeah, it's been an amazing six to nine months now since coronavirus became the rage, rage in more ways than one. 
Um, and science really is going to be the answer to how we get out of this pandemic. And for those of you who teach biology or science in general, there's an amazing story here about the process of science and how quickly the research community has pivoted from whatever they've been doing you know, nine months ago to coronavirus research. So it's, uh, there's, there's some amazing material there that you can use to get your kids excited about science. All right, so in this, uh, so we're, we're gonna try to take this tragedy uh, at various levels and put a positive spin on it and talk about the opportunity. And the opportunity of course, is that your kids and your kids' families are of course very interested now in viruses in general, but COVID-2 in, in specifically. And also everyone is focused now on a vaccine and how that vaccine stimulates our immune system to make, make proteins called antibodies. So we have models that we're gonna use in this session. We have a coronavirus model that we'll be using. Uh, we have a spike protein model that we'll be using. We have goods of landscapes. So we'll be using those to try to make sense out of this coronavirus topic. Um, we also want to introduce you or make you aware of a series of videos that we created. This was soon after the pandemic uh, hit and kids were being sent home from schools. So we recorded a series of videos. There's probably 45 to 50 minutes worth of videos that have been chunked up into short three to four minute videos that address different, different aspects of coronavirus. It's called the Science of Coronavirus series. And those are on the 3DMD website. You're seeing a, a screenshot of uh, one of 3DMD's web pages. So we're not gonna take time in this 40 minute session to play any of those videos, but just know that that information is there. And again, we tried to pitch it as though we were talking to students. So I hope those might be useful to you if you are planning on um, using this pandemic as an opportunity to get your kids excited about uh, biological sciences. Okay, the session today uh, is actually divided into two parts. Um, 40 minutes is a very short time to try to do anything meaningful. So, you know, I can imagine in the future, there'll be a five day course on infectious diseases and coronavirus, viruses in general. So in, in just the 40 minutes that we have, we're gonna, in the first part of this, cover the basics of coronavirus using models. Um, and then the second part of this, we're gonna talk about an opportunity for your students to become involved in what we call a student modeling project in which they will use some computer visualization uh, software as well as 3D printers to actually make a physical model of a protein. And the protein we're gonna focus on are antibodies or in particular a nanobody and we'll be talking about a story of current research in which uh, some people are making a therapeutic nanobody that you'll all be carrying around in your pocket in the next six months to protect yourself from coronavirus. So that's the plan for the next 40 minutes. So I'm gonna start right away then with these two models and I'll start first with this schematic model of a coronavirus. And you've all seen this iconic image uh, on the news or on the internet. Uh, coronavirus is a spherical membrane bounded virus, just like influenza virus. And it has a bunch of proteins called spike proteins. Spike proteins are embedded in this lipid bilayer. It's on the surface then of this uh, coronavirus. And the coronavirus, <clears throat> if you turn this model around, we've split it open so you can see the RNA genome. 29,811 nucleotides of RNA in a single piece make up the coronavirus um, genome. And the way the infection happens <clears throat> is that this virus, you breathe it into your, through your nose, gets into your respiratory system. And then these spike proteins start looking for cell surface receptors. And on this little piece of membrane, 
or maybe an epithelial, respiratory epithelial cell, there's a little green ACE2 protein. This is the receptor protein for the spike protein of CoV2. And when it finds it, it will bind. And as such, then it has docked the coronavirus onto the surface of the cell that it intends to infect. And that in turn triggers a bunch of conformational changes in the structure of this spike protein so that ultimately this membrane the viral membrane fuses with the cellular membrane. And when that happens, this RNA genome is then released into the cytoplasm of that cell, which is now infected. And you start expressing proteins and, and, and replicating this genome, packaging new virus, and the virus is, or the infection is off and running. Uh, so that's the, uh, that's the, uh, that's the virus model. Let me just do this. I have a little antibody here. See how that antibody is binding to the spike protein? Well, that's what we're all waiting for right now. It's a vaccine that will stimulate our immune systems to create antibodies which will bind to a specific part of that spike protein and therefore prevent that infection cycle. I have here a detailed model of the actual 3D structure of a spike protein. And I, I, this is where you know physical models are great, but they're not great to be used in a video like this. Just like they're not great to be used, you know, you holding in front of your class, if you had a class <laughs> of students. So these are meant to be handled and held and, and, and to be built. And we'll talk later about your students are actually going to be creating a model of a part of an antibody as, as part of what we're going to suggest to you. So I'm just going to describe in words what you're really not able to see with any clarity at all in this multicolored hunk of plaster in my hand right now. There are actually three copies of the spike protein in each one of these structures you see on the schematic virus or in, in this. So three identical spike proteins. And two of them are displayed here in what we call a space field or surface format. So you can't see much detail at all. But if I turn this around, you see the one in blue. There's dark blue and then there's, uh, it's continuous with, continuous with this light blue domain. This is one of the three copies in a alpha carbon backbone conformation. And the only thing I wanna point out is that this little domain that's popped up here, it's higher than all the others. This is called the receptor binding domain. And only one of the three copies of spike has its receptor binding domain in the up conformation where it is now capable of binding to that ACE2 receptor, okay? So what we know now, which we didn't know even as recently as six months ago, is the structure of this protein and how this receptor binding domain on all three of these apparently flips back and forth between the down conformation and the up conformation. And it's only in the up conformation that they're able to engage ACE2 and begin the infection process. That will become important in the last part of this session where we talk about a nanobody that locks this receptor binding domain down into the inactive neutralized state of the spike protein. Okay, with that, uh, with that we're gonna switch now to another model, which is known, we, we refer to them as a good cell landscape. And Heather's gonna pop up a digital version of this digital landscape. This comes as a big poster and you'll find all these good cell landscapes on the 3DMD website. I want to zoom out and show them the whole thing. Yeah. So this is uh, about one third of a long poster that has some more panels over here, but we're just gonna quickly go over the first part of this. Uh, and we're gonna spend most of our time talking about this image that David has created that shows a coronavirus being neutralized by antibodies. But before that, we're gonna look at this more schematic view. Influenza. Right. Yeah. Well, I, I, yeah, I should I should say David drew this to illustrate how influenza virus works, but in fact, influenza virus is very similar to coronavirus in that it's an enveloped virus with 
membrane embedded proteins. It's called hemagglutinin in, in this influenza example, but, uh, but we're going to pretend these are spike proteins in coronavirus. But here's the other thing I want to call your attention to. When you breathe in a virus, uh, here are some virus particles that have entered your, your respiratory system. And they don't fall right down on the surface of this respiratory epithelial cell. Instead, there's a thick mucus layer here um, where if all goes well and you have a thick mucus layer lining your, your epithelial cells, these viruses are gonna get trapped. Okay, and now I wanna, so David has, has focused in on this virus trapped in the mucosal lining. And we're gonna, we're gonna bring that over here and we're going to maybe blow it up even a little more so you can see this. And I want to try to point out what's happening here. So first of all, you see a lot of yellow here. And some of the yellow is this long fibrous protein here called mucin. So that's, uh, there are some goblet cells right here. And their whole job is to make and secrete a lot of this fibrous mucin protein. Uh, the other yellow protein, prominent yellow protein you see here, are antibodies. So antibodies are, of course, these three-lobed structures. Whenever David represents an antibody in his illustrations, he orients it so that you see the three lobes. You'll also notice they appear in pairs. These are dimers. So that's something we aren't really going to have time to go into here. But importantly, you'll see that this antibody right here is bound to this protein, which again is hemagglutinin in, in, in influenza. But we're gonna pretend this is the spike protein of coronavirus. And similarly, this antibody has interacted with this spike protein. So if you just, if you had time, and that's why it's great to have these posters on the wall of your classroom because your kids can spend a lot of time just looking carefully and all over the place, you see how the antibodies are interacting with the spike protein. And <clears throat> the antibodies also are interacting with the mucin. So effectively what has happened here is that, is that the virus, because this individual had been uh, vaccinated and as a result of the vaccination has produced these antibodies that can recognize the spike protein, or if they were previously infected, these antibodies were present when this virus tried to infect the cell. But effectively, this virus has been inactivated because first of all, it's going to be trapped in this mu mucus layer, and it's going to be uh, swept up out of the respiratory uh, system and never have a chance to encounter a cell. Uh, we don't have time to go through the rest of this poster down here. So, <clears throat> so we only looked at the virus up here. Hopefully it'll never get down here on the surface of the cell where it can initiate this infection process. It's a fascinating story here. And if this were more than a 40 minute session, we might have time to go into all the molecular details of what goes on here. Um, we simply don't have time to do that right now. But all of these things are available in the caption to the other three, four, five panels on this poster. So I'd really encourage you to take a look at that if you're interested in exploring this in more detail. OK, we're going to pause quickly here. Are we going to pause here, or are we going to so rush right we're on? We're going to. We are right on schedule. OK. So let me go ahead and. Stop sharing here. All right. So now I want to pivot to try to, to try to encourage you to do something, to join us in doing something that we've been doing in the CBM now for 20 years. And that is we design and run what we call student modeling programs. And these programs involve students in identifying a protein that's of some interest. Uh, for, this, for the sake of this presentation, we're going to be talking about uh, the spike protein of coronavirus, but even more specifically, the antibody that is going to bind to the spike protein. Uh, so we're going to, what I'm going to try to convince you of in the next few minutes is that there's great value in you having your kids 
think about what is an antibody as a protein? How, how, what's its structure like? And what, um, how can you use an antibody protein as an example of a protein? So you all teach proteins, right? Protein structure. I hope you teach the principles of chemistry that drive proteins to fold into these complex 3D shapes. So here's a good example of a protein as a linear sequence of amino acids, which folds into a particular protein. So here's the three-lobed antibody. And the main point I want to make here is that this protein is composed, I'm going to take this model apart. This protein is composed of nothing more than 12 copies of what we call an immunoglobulin fold. It's about a 30 amino acid sequence that folds up into a four-stranded beta sheet opposite another four or five-stranded beta sheets. So you got two beta sheets, one on top of the other, and those two sheets are connected by a single disulfide bond. That's an immunoglobulin fold, and biology is modular, having evolved this fold many, many years ago, it simply used this fold to construct an antibody. So this, uh, if you take two of these immunoglobulin folds and you join them together as a 60 amino acid protein, you get what's known as a light chain. An antibody is made up of two light chains this one, another one here on the back side. Uh, so that would be one, two, three, four immunoglobulin folds. And then the heavy chain of which there are two is, is again made up of immunoglobulin folds. And there are one, two, three, four immunoglobulin folds that make up the heavy chain. So there's a total of eight immunoglobulin folds that make up the the antibody protein. They all have different amino acid sequences. They all are, they all conserve though that, that disulfide bond that joins one sheet to another, and they all have two sheets opposite one another. So, so you know, this is where life gets complicated, right? Because uh, what I'm telling you is they're all the same and they're all different. And both of those statements are true. And your job is to get your students to not only understand that, but to sort of appreciate that. That's what's, that's what's interesting about biology. All right, you can't tell anything. So again, don't hold us up in front of the class trying to explain something to your students because they can't see what you can see when your eyes are just a few inches away and you can turn this thing around and examine it. So if I could grab another model, this model. Okay. Yeah, this, this is a little closer, you, and, and you still aren't going to be able to see what I want you to see. Should as we go I, to the overhead camera for a no, minute? No, no, no. This, this is fine, just like this. Uh, <laughs> you can't see what I want you to see, but I just, I just want you to want to have one of these in your hands, because this is what your kids can make in a student modeling program. And not only are your kids going to learn a lot in doing this, uh, you're going to learn a lot in doing this, and this is going to enrich your teaching down the road. The one thing I want to say here that I, that I, I, I forgot to say with this model is, of course, how does this protein function? So out here on the end, the two ends, where one light chain and one heavy chain domain come together, this is the antigen binding region of these proteins. And I've got another simpler model of an antibody right here red light chains and two yellow heavy chains. And this is an epitope. This could be the receptor binding domain of the spike protein. And this antibody has some variable regions out here on the end of these domains, which make it fit and bind specifically to this protein epitope or this antigen. Can you show us that on the spike protein, please? On the spike protein, yes. So remember the spike protein model with one receptor binding domain tipped up, so it's now ready to start an infection. Well, if this represents the receptor binding domain of a spike protein, 
then those vaccines that people are talking about are hoping to elicit an antibody in which the tips of these immunoglobulin folds have been selected such that they can specifically recognize that receptor binding domain of the spike protein and, and inactivate the virus in that way. Okay, so where am I? I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to be talking to you about maps. Is that where we are? Yes, and now <laughs> switching to the antibody modeling packs. Gotcha, pack. gotcha. All right, so student modeling packs. Those of you some of these guys. who registered in advance will have received uh, some tubers. And I think your homework assignment was to construct this, a schematic model of an antibody. And you see here, we have two green white chains. We have two red heavy chains. And what I just told you is that all of these are made up of immunoglobulin folds. So the next thing your students have to do, maybe the two things you do with this, you'd take some aluminum foil or even a piece of paper, crunch it all up in a little ball, and suddenly you have a model of the antigen that is gonna be bound by the tips of these two immunoglobulin folds, one from the heavy chain, one from the light chain. Okay, I hear Where's Heather yours? making an antigen <laughs> right here. All right, so this is, this is the receptor binding domain now of the spike protein. All right, the other thing your, your kids have to do is they have to show that they understand that there are in fact two 30 amino acid immunoglobulin folds that make up this light chain. And then there's one, two, three, four that make up this heavy chain. So even with something as simple as this physical model, this very schematic model of, a, of an antibody, you can start to get your kids to sort of think about what is this protein? And ultimately, why does that sequence of amino acids in each one of those domains fold up into this funny three-dimensional shape? Now, this, this is a 3D printed physical model of an immunoglobulin fold. But what your kids are gonna do then, they're gonna take a tuber and you're gonna give them a very, very difficult assignment. And it might sound easy, but I'll tell you right now, this is gonna be very hard. So you should try this first so you appreciate how hard this is gonna be for your students. So I've told you that an immunoglobulin fold, just so we're gonna make an immunoglobulin fold. And I told you that it's simply made up of a four-stranded beta sheet opposite a, another four-stranded beta sheet connected by a disulfide bond. So right there, I've made one, two, three, four, four strands of a beta sheet. So now you might imagine uh, that the protein, the path of the protein is now gonna go down to the bottom sheet and we'll just make a four-stranded beta sheet there. And these are offset from one another about 20 degrees. So all we would have to do is to put a disulfide bond between these two sheets and we would have an immunoglobulin fold. If, if we were to have designed this protein fold, this, this is the first thing that would come to mind. But that's not right at all, okay? Nature is much, much more interesting than that. So here's, here's what the fold really looks like. The fold really looks like this. And again, I'm waving a model around in front of you what you really need to do is to have one of these tubers or a piece of wire, any bendable material you find around the house. And, and what happens is uh, imagine your fist is a ribosome. So this protein, this antibody protein is being made on a ribosome and it's exiting the ribosome and the end terminal end with this blue marker comes out first. So this protein is gonna begin to fold and right there you make a Two, strand, two strands of a beta sheet, but then the protein goes down and it creates two strands of the bottom sheet, okay? Uh, and actually I'm gonna put three strands down here because yeah, it is three. the folding pattern that you're gonna see uh, says there's three. Uh, this is a bit of a bone of contention, but we're gonna pretend it's three. All right, so we've got a three-stranded beta sheet down here, and then it comes back up and it, it creates 
strand three and four of the top sheet, right? So now I've got one, two, three, four strands up here on top. And then this just goes down. And even though I've done this many times, <laughs> you can see how I'm struggling. You know you're right when the N terminal and the C terminal are pointing in different directions when you're all done. But this is an immunoglobulin fold. And now I'll switch over to this one where I've actually added a disulfide bond that connects a cysteine in the second strand of the top sheet with the cysteine in the next to last strand of the bottom sheet. And the positions presence of these cysteines is one of the conserved features of all 12 of those immunoglobulin folds that make up an antibody protein. So this is one way to get your kid's head around this interesting protein fold. So now, um, if we could pop up, uh, yeah, this slide, Chris is going to trace from the end terminal end that's the first strand of the beta sheet on top, the blue sheet. And there's the second strand. And then it goes down to the green beta sheet. And there's one, two strands of the green sheet. And then you come back up to the top blue sheet. You create the third and fourth strand there. And then you go back down and complete the bottom green. <laughs> All right, so very, very, difficult, but it's an exercise in 3D space. And I hope that you and your kids, um, I hope that you can get your kids to focus and uh, understand the complexity of this and understand that every time you make an antibody protein, you've, you've synthesized on a ribosome these 30 amino acid sequences. And as they come out of the ribosome, they fold every one of them into the same basic fold that ultimately becomes that antibody. All right, fast forward then, if you will, I don't know how many years ago it was that we first determined the structure of an antibody protein. I should actually look that up. But now, the story I wanna tell right now very quickly at the end of this is uh, how scientists have pivoted now to apply all of their molecular expertise to making a solution for coronavirus. So there's a group at UCSF led by a guy named Peter Walter. And um, they were working on some totally unrelated project, uh, unfolded protein response. But with the need to focus on coronavirus, they have, they have, they have selected a nanobody from a library of nanobodies. And they've selected a nanobody that binds to that receptor binding domain of spike protein. And then uh, this, this now is in the area of synthetic biology because they selected it, they engineered it, and ultimately they have produced a nebulizer that you see on this slide that is aerosolizing a small engineered single domain nanobody that's going to bind to the spike protein. So we're going to play now a short two minute video created by that UCSF uh, site. So watch this. Scientists at UCSF have engineered a molecule to act as a new kind of personal protection that prevents COVID-19 by neutralizing coronavirus in the body. SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, is a coronavirus named for the spike proteins that cover its surface. Once inside the airway, the spike protein opens like a flower and fits perfectly into the ACE2 receptor of a lung cell. This allows the virus to enter the cell and release its RNA, forcing the cell to create more coronaviruses that can spread to neighboring cells and infect other people. COVID-19 infection is only possible if the spike protein is able to interact with ACE2. 
Peter Walter and Ashish Manglik of UCSF set out to prevent this interaction by using nanobodies, tiny antibodies originally found in camels and llamas. They tested 2 billion different synthetic nanobodies against SARS-CoV-2. They found one that binds exceptionally well to the spike protein, then they engineered it to make it even more potent. What they came up with is called Aeronab. When Aeronabs bind to the spike protein, the virus can't attach to ACE2 and it loses its ability to infect cells. So the Aeronabs stay on the spike protein for an enormously long time. So after a week of uh, uh, measuring the affinity, we still haven't seen it uh, come off the spike protein. We can make it for very, very cheap using either bacteria or yeast, making an essentially industrial quantities. It's so robust that we can dry it down into a powder that enables us to ship it across the world. Because it's so stable, we can put it in one of these. It's, this is a little nebulizer that would allow us to aerosolize the molecule. Vaccines typically require years of research and production. Aeronabs could be available much faster. Plus, Aeronabs would be inexpensive, perhaps even available over the counter and could be self-administered using an inhaler or nasal spray. Clinical trials testing Aeronab's effectiveness in the body may soon commence. Aeronab's inventors think that trials could prove successful within a few months. Okay, <clears throat> so that was a terrific little video that that explains this one research project um, more succinctly and, and better than I could do in 30 minutes. So um, I know what most of you are thinking right now, and that is, this is great, but this is way too complicated for my kids. And let me first assure you that it's not. We've been doing this for 20 years now. So go on our website, read about the, the MAPS program, Modeling a Protein Story. Uh, it's not like everybody who, who does this antibody module is going to be modeling this story. You can choose whatever, whatever aspect of antibodies is of interest to you and your students. Uh, but this is one that really fascinates us right now. Um, and there will be additional videos and molecular visualizations yeah. and lots of different activities that you can engage your students. So, so that's why, you know, this, this may sound very, very complicated, but in fact, uh, having done this for several years now, we, we recognize what, what you have to do with your students to sort of build them up to the point where they will be using a program called JMOL to actually access the atomic coordinates of this structure. They will explore these in a computer environment, they will design and build features into their model that uh, highlight <clears throat> the end of the nanobody that's binding to the spike protein. And you will be just amazed at what you and your students can do. Uh, the other thing these programs do is they, they involve your kids in real science, often working closely with a local researcher who's studying that protein in their lab. So I would, I would just urge all of you, don't, uh, don't think that this is great, but I can't do it. You can do it. One way you can learn to do it is to come and spend some time with us in our summer workshops. Uh, in that regard, I don't have time to talk to you about these, but go to our website. Uh, we run a course called Modeling the Molecular World. That course is sort of the introductory course, which then qualifies you for advanced courses on genome editing. Coming down the road, the next big project is going to be infectious diseases like coronavirus. And we have right. five minutes for questions Terrific. and other comments then. So, so I'm so amazed that we have any Post time. them in chat. Yeah. Or turn off your mic and shout out because Tim will just keep talking. I, but I, if there's something that you want him to talk about, let us know. And if we don't get to all of our questions, we will we can follow up um, with emails and and everything afterwards. So yeah. let us know what you're wondering. Yep. All right. I can't really see the chat, but if someone uh, <clears throat> getting some very cool and thanks. How are the COVID vaccines different from each other? Whoa, well, now there's a topic for an hour. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
uh, there are this, this uh, you know, stories of science. Um, the, the vaccine program that people are engaged in right now, I mean, we're never gonna have a pandemic like this again because we're gonna have developed a technology this time that allows us to quickly make vaccines. So you've probably been hearing about an RNA vaccine, which is, to my knowledge, the first time people have even tried this. And it sounds like that Pfizer vaccine that everyone is waiting for is in fact an RNA vaccine. So it used to be we would use attenuated virus, you know, inactivated virus. We just inject that into people knowing or at least hoping that it wasn't gonna cause disease, um, but that our immune system would react to the proteins on that dead virus. But now we've gone so far as we're, we're now introducing RNA. So in a the vaccine, there's some RNA, which is translated by our ribosomes into a protein. In this case, I don't know the details yet because these companies are very secretive in terms of exactly what they're doing. But it's, it's, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's a domain of that spike protein. Exactly which domain is not really known. But you know what? That might be something that your your student modeling team would, would model because by the time they're ready to do this, say in February, uh, that information is probably going to be available. Wouldn't it be cool if your kids were actually taking information that was made available a week or two before and actually highlighting that part of the spike protein, which the which the Pfizer vaccine, the antibodies elicited by the Pfizer vaccine is interacting with. So <clears throat> that's a non-answer. There, there are lots of, lots of ways that vaccines are now being designed. And uh, the key point is we're gonna be able to design them very, very quickly. And this, this idea of having to have you know, five, six, 10 years from start to finish to having a vaccine, uh, that's in the past. Uh, and that's another, it's another success of modern molecular science. Anything else? So we do need to be wrapping up so that we can do our next session, um, which is sensational water. So then we hope that you'll be able to join us for that. And if there are any questions that we missed, we'll go ahead and follow up via email. So we really appreciate everybody attending. All right. We hope to see you at a summer course. Uh, check out our website. Okay. Thank you, everyone. So, all right. I'm getting tons of thank yous here. And I. Good, good. Yep. So, okay. We will be going ahead and ending the meeting. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>